though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, he is with us. His rod and his staff, they comfort us. Staff is familiar with. The rod, maybe less so. In Africa, they call this rod a rungu. It's a loan to us. J. and a Coward. This was used by a shepherd in Africa. And as you can see, this rod will do some damage. Shepherds would use this to protect the flock from predators. Not only that, it could be thrown. Go end over end and wallow a predator, a lion, a tiger, a bear, you name it, in the noggin. Take it out. I'm curious what predator or predators have hounded you this past week? What obstacles have prevented you from better following the Good Shepherd? How do you need God to intervene and protect you? Even though we walk in the valley of the shadow of death, we fear no evil, for God is with us. His rock and His staff, they comfort us. What comfort do you need this morning? Let us prepare ourselves to worship the God of our salvation, the good shepherd indeed. Sunday this month, we have been reciting together 
a different version of the 23rd Psalm. Today is our final day coming to us from the contemporary <laughs> English version. By hearing it differently, it's enabled us to apply it differently, to recognize that we are sheep, but we are beloved by the Good Shepherd. So this morning, as we listen, as we recite together, as we share, our prayer is that we might see the Good Shepherd in our midst and recognize God's overabundant love for each of us. Brothers and sisters, may the peace of Christ be with you. Let's stand, let's look around and greet one another in the name of Jesus.
for heaven. In terms of worship and devotion to the one we will worship for all eternity. Therefore, we need to praise and honor our Lord every day to create a seamless transition to our role as eternal citizens of the New Jerusalem. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we have gathered in your house this morning to worship you. You alone are worthy of our praise, glory, and honor for all you have created. We thank you for revealing yourself to us through your word, by your spirit, and in your creation, that we may stand in awe of you. You made the heavens and the earth by your great power. Nothing is too difficult for you. We thank you for loving us and always being there for us. Thank you for being our solid rock, our fortress, our rescuer, our shield, our shepherd, our salvation strength, and our place of safety. We praise you for your mercy, your compassion, and your forgiveness. Thank you for being slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. We praise you that righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Lord, we pray that for every request we offer, every supplication that we raise, and every intercession we make, that we may never neglect to render the praise you are due. Forgive us when we ask for petty things. Increase our faith so we ask for big, powerful, glorious things in your name. And now, please, Lord, think through us. Live through us and love through us. And make us a channel of your love, joy, and peace. In your precious name, we pray. Amen. Our scripture today is the... 23rd Psalm, and it comes from the contemporary English version. Please join with me as we read together. You, Lord, are my shepherd. I will never be with you. You let me rest in fields of green grass. You lead me to streams of peaceful water, and you refresh my life. You are true to me.
it is. So this morning I'm going to tell you a bedtime story in the middle of the day, but you can't go to sleep, okay? Sheep and lambs have been the most important thing in my family with my grandchildren. My granddaughter, my oldest granddaughter, is fixing to be 20 years old and don't matter how old I am. But when she was about three, we started telling bedtime stories. And so I thought, what can I tell about? So we started bedtime stories about sheep and about lambs. And we had two brothers named George and Roger. And we had a little sister named Dee. And so they lived in a big house on a big farm, and their dad was an accountant in the barn, Papa Sheep. And so George and Roger would cross the fence, and they would go to school in the mornings. And when B started to kindergarten in her pink calico dress, she could not get across the fence. She was too little. So George and Roger would help her get across the fence. And they went to school. While Dad was the accountant at the barn. And when they came home, Mama Sheep would take them out in the yard to, in the sunshine, to graze, eat their dinner, and have fun in the sunshine. When my third grandchild came along, she thought there should be more sheep, more lambs. So she decided, for some unknown reason, that their names should be, that they should have to be triplets or twins, and unknowing that sheep are usually born as twins or triplets. She decided that their names should be Roger and George, Little B and A, C, and D. <laughs> so from then on, they had a bigger family. In the 20 years that I've been telling that story, and you can imagine my 20 year old and my 18 year old don't really care to hear it again, but they have lots of lambs and and sheep that are, are stuffed and carved and all kinds of things to keep it in their mind. So in the last 20 years, the stories have changed, but the characters have not. They've always been the same. Now we know that this is a silly bedtime story, and we have found the sheep like us have a lot of hard times in life. They can't see well, and if they fall and get turned over, they can't turn themselves back without help. Then their legs don't work. And the sheep herders are not the owners of the sheep. They're just there to watch the sheep. And they, they don't always care and give the sheep the love that the shepherd would give them. So if a wolf comes, sometimes sheep herders just run off and leave the wool, the, leave the uh, sheep to the wolves. So they don't always do a good job with that. Who is our shepherd? Who? You're the shepherd? Well, you might be. Who is our real shepherd? Layla. Jesus and God. Those are our real shepherds. And and he uses this analogy because he is our shepherd and we are his sheep. In John 10, 14, Jesus tells us, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. And he's really talking about us. He knows us and if we're Christians, we know him. He says, I lay down my life for the sheep, which means we who believe in God we are like the sheep, and Jesus died on the cross for us. No one made Jesus die for us. He did it willingly because he loves us. 
Jesus says he has other sheep that haven't come into the sheep pen yet. Well, those are the people who don't know him, but he loves them anyway. We can help God do, do what he wants to do to bring his people or sheep into the sheep pen by telling others about Jesus at school, at church, anywhere that you have friends, you could tell them about Jesus. Or if it's not a friend, if it's somebody that just came to school and you're making a friend, there's a lot of things we can do to help Jesus bring those into the sheep pen. Let us pray. Thank you for these little lambs who are here today and for our wonderful shepherd who died for us that we might live. And with my own prayer today, as Reverend Jeff was telling us, I pray that my son will make it to Poland safely today. Watch over us this week, and thank you so much for all those who are here today and all those who couldn't be here. Um,
during the period from the death and resurrection of Jesus to the first writings of the apostles, there was about two or two and a half decades, from about 32 A.D. until the 50s A.D. No New Testament, no guidelines for these new churches, except what they may have borrowed from the Old Testament, and they did do that, but they needed instruction and guidance from the perspective of what Christ taught. And until the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John types of letters came out, there was very little for these new churches to use as guidelines. On Wednesday nights, Pastor Jeff has been leading us in a discussion about a right group of writings called the Didache. I stole one of them from last week's prayer meeting time because I thought that this was a very interesting document. And it came, contains about 16 items with multiple sub-items in it about how to live the Christian life. Uh, uh, and the topics are interesting. Uh, see that no one leads you astray. The way of death. How to fast and pray. After the Eucharist. Welcome the teacher. And so forth. I knew I was going to be doing the offertory prayer today, so I started filtering through all these directions to look to see what the early church was told to do about giving. There were a lot of them in here. I'm just going to read two of them. One of them is, do not hesitate to give and don't complain about it. And one of them is, do not be one who opens his hand to receive or closes it when it is time to give. That still applies to us today in our church. Will you pray with me? Father, we thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you for being able to be here and worship together. We pray, Father, that we will take the heart the admonition that you give to us to open our hands to take care of our community, our church, our world, through missions and through other operations of your church. Bless us now as we give our offerings and tithes to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>
to the end of our strength, to the end of our light. And we wonder how we're going to take the next step. But we can understand that our good shepherd already sees the path. And if we trust him, the path will become clear. Let's pray. Lord, so many times we struggle. So many times we don't know what the answers are. So many times we don't know what the path is going to be or where it's going to lead. But Lord, we know that you are our good shepherd. That you guide us. You strengthen us. You nourish us. You provide us with fresh water and places to lie down in peace. Lord, we ask that you help us to remember as we go through the trials and struggles of our lives, whatever they may be, that you are there beside us, guiding us, encouraging us, and lighting our path. Lord, help us to remember that there is nowhere that we're going to go that you haven't already been. Lord, help us to trust you for your guidance and your care. For it's in your name we pray.
Gospel according to John, chapter 10, beginning with verse 11. I am the head shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. The hired man, who is not the shepherd and is not of the sheep, sees the wolf and then leaves the sheep and runs away. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because the hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. I have received this command from my Father. This is the word of the Lord. And thanks be to God. Today, Jesus describes two kinds of sheep keepers. The shepherd we're quite familiar with at this point. But the other that's going to deserve our attention on the front end is this hired hand. Jesus describes him or her as such. The hired hand, who is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away. And the wolf, the wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because a hired hand does not care for the sheep. The sheep need tending to. We've learned that over these past few weeks. And if a shepherd cannot tend to his or her sheep, she will need to hire someone who will. Jesus tells us that an employee or a hired hand will not bring the same kind of care or commitment to bear in their responsibilities as the employer shepherd. We know this. This makes perfect sense to us some 21 centuries later. If it's your shop, you're going to have greater concern for it than the employees that you bring on to help run it. Likewise, with a shepherd and their sheep, when danger arises, the hired hand will cut and run. Why? Quite simply, it's not their sheep. If a wolf stalks the flock and then attacks the sheep, and they scatter, the hired hand has no real incentive to stay. I mean, really, do you want to stare down a wolf? They'd rather save themselves. They don't care about the sheep because they don't belong to him. Actually, ancient Jewish law had a response to this question of sheep and their hired hand. It had been ruled that if a hired hand encountered a lone wolf while they were out watching the sheep, they were legally compelled to defend the flock. But, if there was more than one wolf, they were legally okay and in the clear to desert the flock and run for help. In Jesus' example, however, he doesn't believe that the hired hand will stay to protect the sheep even if there's only one wolf. That's how well Jesus knows us. This is how we know that those who do not have much invested in something will not have the staying power to defend it. No. 
Jesus believes that the hired hand's commitment level and the amount of care and concern for the sheep is pitifully small. The hired hand, they give just a dab of themselves to the sheep. Oh, but a good shepherd goes far beyond what the hired hand is willing to do. We know a few things about what a good shepherd does. The 23rd Psalm describes it clearly. The good shepherd is someone who eradicates fear on an everyday basis so that the sheep will lie down and settle. A good shepherd knows where the right nourishment is and leads the sheep so that they can drink and eat and have nourishment. A good shepherd will be on the lookout so that the sheep don't get lost and find themselves right side up. A good shepherd cares for and guides the sheep. A good shepherd uses a club to protect the sheep from predators and carries a staff to rescue them. I think it was at Christmas time. In fact, I'm sure that when a woman was having a very difficult time, her family life was hard, her husband's job was not going well, she was strung out, she was at her wit's end. There were moments in her family life, in her personal life, where she felt like she had fallen into a ditch. So when she received the curriculum to teach the Sunday school class at Christmas to three-year-olds, she laughed out loud. Actually, it was one of ridicule. She could not believe that the Sunday school material for small children at Christmas was about Jesus being the good shepherd. What in the world did these city children know about sheep or shepherds? This was ridiculous. So she had a bad attitude going into it. In one of the lessons she remembered, she had suffered through the obligatory, let's take a cotton ball and put it on a sheep and call it a sheep. Children were crazy. They were, they were sugared up. She was at her wit's end. Weary, she sat in circle time with them. And she asked them, all right, children, what is a good shepherd? And to her surprise, one of the three-year-olds spoke up and said, he picks up the sheep when they fall down. The shepherd picks up the sheep when they fall down. Even the youngest among them know that. The truth is, we know what a good shepherd is does. But Jesus is not a good shepherd. Read your Bible, y'all. He is the good shepherd. Why? He lays down his life for the sheep. Here's the thing, y'all. And Jesus' audience would absolutely have known this. No shepherd would ever, ever do such a thing. It's a ridiculous proposition, actually. It was one that would have made people laugh and gasp. Now, the only reason why a shepherd might lose their life watching sheep was by accident or foolishness on their part. A shepherd would never willingly lay down his or her life for a sheep. Would you? Jesus wants to make this abundantly clear to us. He is the good shepherd. He lays down his life for his sheep. He says it clearly. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. And just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay my life down for the sheep. It's interesting here. According to John, Jesus doesn't want us to miss what he's saying. This sacrificial action that he describes, it's not an accident. He wants us to know that he is not being compelled to give up his life. He is willingly laying down his life. Voluntarily. He says this much. I lay my life down of my own accord. 
Now, someone who is compelled to do something hard is worthy of honor because of their obedience and loyal, loyalty to the master. We understand this. But, someone who voluntarily gives their life for others does so only out of love and concern for those in whom they have died for. He sacrifices himself so that others might live, to have a life rich and abundant. This is what sets Jesus apart. The good shepherd is set apart because his love for his sheep will result in sacrifice. Now let's stop for a second and ask this obvious question. What kind of God does this? This love and commitment isn't shallow like the hired hands. It won't tease us with flavor. In fact, Jesus' love for his sheep is so great that he makes it abundantly clear that not everyone's been gathered around. He knows that there are those who are missing. He says, how about the sheep that do not belong to this fold? I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one sheep. Now, historically and traditionally, this has been understood as though Jesus is talking to a Jewish audience and that who he's describing are non-Jews, the Gentiles. And that works really well for us because we would be those Gentiles. We're not Jewish. But what is our understanding of this in the 21st century? It's really quite straightforward, though some of us may not like it. It's this. We are not the only ones. We're not alone. Jesus, the good shepherd, knows this, and he's not content with it. Jesus' love for us and for all of his sheep is so great that he is seeking unity. This is how great God's love is for us. It's hard to imagine, isn't it? We've become so accustomed to this amount of love and sacrifice in this world. God's love is doled out in wee little cups. It may give us a taste of God's deep love, but it certainly won't quench our thirst, will it? What's more, we're thirsty, aren't we? The woman at the well certainly was. <clears throat> you remember her? Her life was like that. Woman in the city at Christmas time. Strung out, hard, difficult. Her life hadn't turned out the way she had hoped, not one bit. <clears throat> she found herself out at the well, the heat of the day. You just don't do that, unless, of course, your life has just been one scandal after another. So she goes out. And Jesus, breaking all kinds of convention, sits there with her. She's a Samaritan. Jesus is not. She's willing to engage Jesus, and Jesus uses water as a way to describe who he is and the effect that Jesus will have on her life. Lucky for her, she has an encounter with Jesus who would say, everyone who drinks of this water from this well will be thirsty again, but those who drink of the water that I give them, they'll never be thirsty again. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. With Jesus as the good shepherd, our cups will overflow. Jesus pours himself out for us. He gives himself completely to us. 
He sacrifices himself so that we may have life and to have it in abundance, not in a king cup. No. The Lord is the good shepherd. We shall not want. He makes us to lie down in green pastures. He leads us beside still waters. He restores our souls. He leads us in right paths for his name's sake. Even though we walk through the darkest valley, we fear no evil. For you are with us. Your rod and your staff, they comfort us. You prepare a table before us in the presence of our enemies. You anoint our heads with oil. Our cup overflows. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives, and we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Let us pray. God, we are so very grateful that you are the good shepherd. You have poured yourself out for us. Your cup, the new covenant sealed in your blood was poured out for us. And because of it, we can experience abundant life. And for that, God, we say thank you. Allow us, God, to be changed by this reality, to trust you as our good shepherd, to trust that you know where you are leading us, and that because of your great love and sacrifice, you do prepare a table before us in the face of our enemies and sabotages and obstacles, and that we might drink deeply from your love and might never be thirsty again. It is with a grateful heart, God, that we say thank you and ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Say yes to Christ Jesus who wishes to shepherd you. Say yes to this church this morning. Say yes. Brothers and sisters, let's stand. Let's sing and let's pray.
Jesus. I am so very glad that you all go and hear Jesus' message for you and that you create something to bring back and present to him. The circuit will be back home with you, okay? You guys can go back to your mom's and dad's. Make sure you get the right one. Absolutely. Y'all, this next Wednesday, we complete our study on Didache. That is, as Gary was describing, an ancient document. Even if you had missed the first few, it's still not too late to come and show up and steal a copy. So please consider joining us on Wednesday. Um, additionally, you already know what the menu is going to be. It's baked potato and chili. So I know you want to join us for that. You'll also see that a week from now, February 5th, we have an important and special program brought to us by WMU. Um, we have a representative who's going to come and guide us in some conversations that we need to have with them. And we certainly are not so sure that the church should offer them. But actually, I think the church should be the ones to talk about estate planning and the realities of in all that care. Personally, I didn't think that this was an important conversation to have until, of course, this past year of my family experienced the loss of a father. Um, these are important conversations to have in the church. In my opinion, it should be leaders in having honest conversations about life and death because we don't have to fear death because we belong to the Good Shepherd who walks with us through that path. So I do hope that a week from Wednesday, February 5th, you will make plans to join us during our normal other Bible study time. Um, the following Wednesday and February, we'll begin a new Bible study. But don't miss this. Um, and if you have any questions, of course, please let us know. You'll also see that our youth have got some good things going on. Apparently, there's a football game next Sunday evening. Who is it? It's the, it's the Chiefs and the Panthers, right? <laughs> Laughter was full of derision. Now it's it's the Chiefs and the 49ers. So it's going to be a good game, I think. Um, youth, come out. Youth are sixth graders up. Bring your friends. We're going to be joining with our downtown um, youth. I know we admission fellowship center, but we're going to watch the game on that big screen. And so, um, even if the game's terrible, those are going to be some amazing commercials up there on that big screen. You'll also see. That in a couple of weeks we have a Valentine's banquet. Carol, tell us about what that is and how we can make sure we're there. All right, on February the 8th at 6 o'clock, we're going to be having a Valentine's banquet hosted by the U. The proceeds from this event will go toward the passport, which, if any of you understand how much that is, it has become insanely expensive. Um, that evening will include dinner. Entertainment. Um, I've been promised some guitar music during dinner. Um, so come out and enjoy that night. Dinner will include um, drink, salad, dessert, everything all in one. The youth will be serving the tables, so you won't have to get up and go through a line. They will bring your food to you and you can have a nice um, dinner at the table with your loved ones. In order to make a reservation, and we do need a reservation, um, you can do several things. I'm going to ask the youth that are here to come down this morning, please, um, now, if you guys would get up and come forward. Um, I'm going to give these guys a sign-up sheet in just a minute, and they will be out there, and you can sign up with them. You can also call the office and sign up in the office, or you can go online, Love Modern Technology, and make your reservation online. But we do need a reservation by Friday the 7th at noon because we have to have time to buy food and make sure that everyone gets fed. So any of those three ways are fine. We will keep a record of, of who made reservations. So don't worry about that. We're not going to lose your reservation. But um, you can see these guys. Where's Trina? Trina, come on. Come on, man. Down here. You can see one of these guys. Um, any of the other youth that are not here today, you can see one of them. But they're going to be out there today. And then call the office, make a reservation online, but let us know you're coming. 
Don't take our word for it. Passport Mission Camp is an indispensable way to become a group and to put our actions um, and our beliefs together. Um, it's life changing. And it's true, it does cost something of us, but our youth are demonstrating willingness to earn the way to go. Um, and there is self interest here. This is going to be our Valentine's Day night. Did you know that? <laughs> and it can be yours also. We do hope that you will say yes. We have asked. And you, we need you to ask us um, so that we can support you and then have a great time together as a church family in a couple of weeks. Thank you, Carol. Thank you, you, for your leadership so that we can support you. Let's stand together, shall we? We invite you to play guard or support hands, depending on the cold and flu season in your view. We do so, of course, to remind ourselves that we are connected. It also helps us to know when others of us who are part of our church family are not able to be here because they themselves are not well or out of town. We're celebrating the arrival of a new baby in our midst as we did this past week. Um, we are a church family, and this helps us to practice what God invites us to do and be a part of. Now, to our God, by the power of work within us, is able to do a to a to accomplish abundantly more than we could ever ask for a man. To God, who glory of the church of Christ Jesus for all generations, forever and ever. Amen. And let us sing again. <laughs>